importing that. And a lot of the useful stuff is in the submodule uh, called tensor. So we usually import that as T. Um, so the key difference between Theano and something like NumPy is that it supports symbolic variables. Um, so we can create one of these through the tensor module. We'll create a scalar symbolic variable. If you look at that, it's something called a tensor type. Um, it says the dimensionality and the data type, but it doesn't have a value. It's just a variable. Um, so once we have a variable, we can write a mathematical expression using that. So here we'll define y is 3x squared plus 1. Um, and if we look at the resulting um, object that we get, it's also a tensor variable. So it's not quite the same as x, but it's basically is very similar. We can do a lot of the same things with it. And if we uh, want to take a look at this, what's called a symbolic expression, if we print it, we get something that's not super informative, but it's telling us um, this is what Theano you know, calls an op, or it's an operation. Um, so basically, this is the last operation in calculating that expression that we defined. So um, if we want to dig a little deeper, Theano has a uh, function called uh, pprint, which can show us the full computational graph of that expression. And now we can see some similarities to what we typed before. And a slightly nicer way of looking at it is something called debug print, which just formats this a little bit differently. Um, and it shows the, the sequence of ops that are creating, making up this expression. Um, and down here we can see this is our original X, our tensor type. And the final way, if you want to look at it in a sort of more graphical way, um, using PyDot and GraphViz, I personally find this a lot easier to understand or to read. Um, we can see we had, this was our original variable X. We're taking um, a constant value 2, we're putting it through this um, power operation, and then we combine it with the times 3, adding 1, and we finally get our output. Um, now, if we want to actually get an answer out of this, we have to evaluate the expression. Um, and the way to do that is through this eval method on the expression variable. So we have to supply um, a dictionary telling Theano what values to put into our input variable, in which case, in this case, it's just x. We're going to supply the value 2, and we get out a numerical answer. Um, so this is good for you know, like a quick one-off evaluation. But we can also compile a function where now we're going to call this um, Theano function called function. We're going to tell it the inputs we're going to give it is x, and the output we want is the, um, our expression y. And that's going to return a callable function f. So now we can just call that function with our input, and we get out um, the answer. Question? <coughs> Do I what? Like in your definition of y, you gave the variable x. Mm -hmm. But in this example, do you have to give it specifically x, or can you give some like unique catch-all for like a scalar? Um, so in this, when you're compiling the function, you have to give it x, because what Theano is going to do is it's going to see I want to calculate y, so it's going to try and figure out what it has to do to calculate y. And if I don't give it x, it's going to give me an error saying missing input error or something like that, because it doesn't know what to put into the um, expression. Um, yeah, good question. Um, but once it's compiled, I can put in anything I want. What's the bracket signify? Oh, so um, one peculiarity is it always expects a list of inputs uh, because you often have multiple inputs going into an expression. So even if you have a single one, you have to put it into a list. And you can also... Um, you could have a list here of multiple outputs that you wanted to compute as well, if you had uh, multiple expressions defined on the same input. Sorry, I'm trying to get into my slides again. Um, so once you compile a function, we can take a look at that in the same way um, we did before. And we can see that it's been uh, transformed a little bit from the graph that we saw earlier. And this is one of the uh, nice things about Theano, is it can apply a number of optimizations uh, when it's doing these um, 
compilation. And also in this case, um, another really nice thing is a lot of the time it can transparently um, compile your, your operations to run on a GPU. So that's why we see here this GPU from host and host from GPU. It's actually transferring the data to the GPU, doing this tiny operation and sending it back, which is not something you necessarily want for this, but um, for many times that can be um, or give you a real speed up. Um, let's see. Yes. So in addition to scalars, you have other things, tensors, matrices, and three and four dimensional uh, tensors, or sorry, vectors, matrices. Um, if you need something uh, bigger than that, you can define your own tensor type, but usually this would give you um, all the variables you would need. And you can do a lot of the normal stuff you would do in NumPy with these uh, expressions. You can do um, indexing, and you can even do you know, fancy indexing, although this will often, this uses an op called advanced subtensor, which can often be somewhat um, inefficient, so you want to be careful how fancy you get. Um, you can also do a lot of you know, numerical um, calculations, functions, either through um, variable methods or through the uh, you know, dot tensor module. Uh, but you shouldn't try and use just arbitrary NumPy functions on the variables. A lot of the time it will work because Thano is pretty smart about converting things um, into back and forth between NumPy, but sometimes you'll get something that looks like it works, but it gives you something that's just not what you expected at all. Um, so to be safe, you should always use the Thano um, functions. So another really nice thing about Thano is it has what's called automatic differentiation. So pretty much all of the ops that it uses know how to calculate their gradient. And so if you want to get the derivative of something, or the gradient with respect to um, something, it can basically go backwards from the, the output and uh, calculate it in a way that's pretty efficient. And you basically, you don't have to do any of the work. You can just define your uh, expression and then call this uh, t.grad. So we're gonna take the gradient of log of x with respect to x. And that gives us another expression for the, the gradient. And if we, we can then just evaluate that expression. Um, so that uh, is really handy when you're working with neural networks because a lot of the time you're trying to do gradient descent. So the first thing you need is the gradient of your loss function. Um, let's see. What's that? Um, I think I'm not really clear on the distinction. Like, I think it's not really symbolic in the sense of like Mathematica would give you a symbolic derivative, um, but it does work on these symbolic expressions. So it's not like a numerical differentiation. Um, so another really important part of the end is what's called shared variables. So that's uh, combining one of these symbolic variables with some storage. Um, so we can create a shared variable uh, from a NumPy array. And uh, something that I should mention that's pretty important is um, if you're ever working with a GPU, which a lot of the time you want to be, they typically only support uh, float32 data. And so you have to be careful that anytime you're um, putting something into a Theano variable, you cast it to float32. Otherwise, um, either you'll get a Theano error or it will sort of, it won't be able to move that computation to the GPU. And so your program might run a lot slower than it would otherwise. Um, so that's why uh, Theano can be configured to work with either um, float32 or float64 by default. And that's stored in this variable, um, theano.config.floatx. Uh, so here I'm creating a shared variable. And so we see that if I look at what I get, it's not the same thing as the I had before, but it's still, um, it's this other thing called a CUDA-ND array. So that tells me that it's on the GPU. It tells me the data type, and it tells me um, what kind of tensor it is. And once when we have this, then we can um, get and set 
the value that's stored in there. So we can um, use the get value. You can see that it has the shape that we put in there, and we have a bunch of zeros. And we could also put some other value into there with the set value. Um, and we can use this the same way we used um, a normal symbolic variable. We can write an expression. We get an expression back. But the key difference is when we evaluate this expression, we don't need to give an input anymore. It's going to use the value that was stored in that shared variable. Um, so we can just take that expression, directly call eval on it with no um, parameters, and we get out um, the right answer. And if we want to compile a function, now we don't need to pass any um, inputs, but we still give an empty list, and we can just get a function back, we call it, we get the answer. Question? Um, well, let me see if the next slide explains that. So the use for this is that there's something called updates. So now you might want to have a function that calculates something, and you can then uh, take the, some of the output of that function and map it back into one of your shared variables. And then when you call the function, DNO is going to automatically update that shared variable. Um, and so here's just a, so a little example. I create a shared variable with the value of zero. I create an expression, so we're going to increment count by one, and then we define our updates, which is just mapping uh, count to this new count expression. Now we compile a function. It doesn't take any inputs. It calculates count, so it's going to return um, the current value of count, and it's going to apply these updates that we um, did. So we call that, we get zero. Next time we call it, we get one. Call it again, two. Um, and so this becomes useful when you have something um, like gradient descent. You define a, um, a function that's going to calculate, it's going to take your gradients, calculate an update step, and then you can um, apply that automatically to your weight matrices or whatnot. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, basically, that's the very basics of piano, and those are the things that you, you would find um, yourself using most often. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, so that's the other thing. So you said it was like a CUDA ND array. So that means it's being, it lives on the GPU. If I'm doing a computation on the GPU, it can store the, the update there without having to come back to the host and then back to the GPU. Um, so yeah, so that would speed things up a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it was created by a neural network lab. People use it for other machine learning things. I'm sure someone's using it for differential equations. I don't know of any examples off the top of my head, though. Yeah, so it's uh, NVIDIA only. Um, people are working on OpenCL, but it's not there yet. Um, so if you want um, to try this, I've made a, another notebook um, with a few exercises. You can um, try them now or later if you want. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any questions you want me to go through any of these. Um, basically just, uh, you know, calculating a simple function, calculating something using updates, and then calculating something a little more complicated. You can implement the game of life. Um, but I think I'm going to move on to uh, lasagna now. Um, so lasagna is a lightweight library uh, meant to make it easier to build and train neural networks using Theano. And so it's basically uh, two things. It's a bookkeeping device and a collection of helper functions. And so what I mean by a bookkeeping device is when you're creating a neural network, you typically have layers of neurons, and you want to take the output from one layer, put it into another layer, and so forth. And when you're doing that, you have to create a bunch of weight matrices. Um, 
And to do that, you need to know, you know the size of your output, how it changes as you propagate through the network. Um, and that can be a little tricky in the end when you have symbolic tensors that don't have a shape until you evaluate them. Um, so basically what lasagna does is it does all the sort of um, all the work of calculating how your shape changes and automatically creating um, weights and biases of the right shape for you. And it also has, um, does a few things to make the API a little cleaner um, and more consistent. And along with that, it implements a number of um, useful things like variants of gradient descent or different initialization schemes for your weights, um, different objective functions. And basically, it's, um, it's intended to be as simple and transparent um, as it can be and to not really hide Theano, um, but to just give you things that work with Theano expressions, um, let you use Theano when you need to, but just make it a little easier um, to define these kind of structures. Um, so the main part of lasagna are uh, layer classes. So these are meant to be an abstraction of a layer of neurons in a network. Uh, but there's also layers that do other things, um, like just shaping your output in different ways, taking slices or reshaping. Um, and the main things that they do are they know what layer they're getting their input from. And they, as I said, they propagate uh, the shape of your data through the network. And they also create and manage the parameters of each layer which is typically a weight matrix and a bias vector. So there's some other important modules um, in it, which has these different ways of initializing the weights. Objectives gives you different loss functions and um, evaluation metrics. Regularization uh, gives you functions to calculate different penalties on your uh, parameters. And updates is another big one, which has a bunch of different methods um, for gradient descent. And unfortunately, this slide is too big. But um, this is just a, a quick overview of the typical way you would use lasagna. So you would define your layer sequence. You would start with an input layer, where you would define the shape of the input coming into the network. And then you would add some other layers. Um, it could be you know, just uh, fully connected, um, dense layers. Then you would call a lasagna function, giving it some input variable, and you get an output expression for um, the data once it's been propagated through this network. You would then um, define the loss function, given that output and some other symbolic input that's your target um, labels. You then pass that to one of those uh, functions from uh, the, the uh, updates module, so some um, optimizer. And you also have to give that um, all of the parameters in the layers in your network, which Lasagna can give you. And that will give you a set of updates, uh, which you would then use to compile a function that would update your parameters. And then you can just call that function in the training loop, and it will train your network. And there's some uh, good resources. Uh, there's a fairly comprehensive uh, set of documentation. There's also this repository has a lot of examples. And uh, the Google user group is fairly active if you have questions. Um, are there any questions about any of that? OK. So I'm going to demonstrate that. Uh, that little workflow I showed you with a simple example on MNIST. And that's kind of boring, but we'll get to some other things um, shortly. So basically, start out doing all our usual imports, NumPy, Theano, Lasagna. Um, I don't know if I should run that. Yeah. Uh, that is a good question. Does anyone know how to make the text bigger? Sorry about that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. That's not good. Okay. 
think that's pretty good. Okay, so we do our imports. Um, you want to usually see the random number generator. Uh, you can download um, the data set in a nice um, Python format from this address. We then uh, load it, um, split it into training and test validation. Uh, so the data was originally uh, 28 by 28 images, but it's been uh, flattened into just um, semi four dimensional array. And we have 50,000 training examples. And just to get an idea of what they look like, if you haven't seen them before, um, we can plot a few, a few of them. So we have handwritten numbers. And we're going to be trying to you know, classify these into what number they are. Um, so in order to train, we're going to want to define a network, and then we're going to train, we're going to um, feed our data through in small batches. So you do this for efficiency. Um, particularly if you're on the GPU, you can process a number of examples in parallel. Um, so we're just going to define a little uh, function generator that's going to return us um, small batches of images and labels. And we're going to start with basically the simplest possible network. Uh, so we're just going to define an input layer, and we're going to tell it um, the dimensionality of the input. And here, we could put the batch size, but if we put none, that's going to make it more general, so we can later uh, call this network with any number of examples, any batch size we want. Um, and then we're going to have a dense layer or fully connected layer where we're connecting it to the input layer. We're going to have 10 uh, units or neurons. And we're going to have a softmax nonlinearity after the output. Um, so that's going to give us a probability distribution over these um, our 10 uh, classes. Then we're going to define symbolic variables for our input, which will be a matrix, because we have a batch dimension and then um, our one, our vector input. And our targets are just going to be a vector. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between i vector and this vector? Uh, so i vector tells Dana that it's a vector of integers. Um, let's see. OK, so then we want to calculate uh, the output after propagating through this network. And we, to do that, we use this helper function, lasagna layers .get output. And uh, for this, you want to give it uh, the output layer where you're trying to calculate the output. Um, and it's also going to need the uh, input variable. And so this is going to um, this is going to go back through our network um, until it finds the input layer, and then it's going to apply this input variable there. Um, it can be a little confusing because you might not expect, you might think that this would just give you the output of some particular layer. There's a different function, get output for, which could then you can supply the input going to that layer and it would give you the output just that one layer. But by default, you want to propagate backwards until you get to the input. Um, and we can also, so this output, like I said, it's a probability distribution. We can also get a predicted class by taking the, the argmax. Um, and it's over the final dimension because we don't want to. Um, we still want to leave the batch dimension intact. Um, let's see. So now that we have an output, we can uh, define a loss function. So we're going to use uh, in lasagna objectives uh, this categorical cross entropy loss. And so we give it our output expression and our symbolic um, targets. And um, so we're using categorical cross entropy because our input targets are uh, integers, so um, like zero through nine. You could also have like a one-hot encoding, um, in which case you'd use a different objective function. And then, um, so the you know, um, to calculate the, the gradients, we need to give it a scalar loss function. So we're just going to take the mean over. Um, this will be over the batch, um, or it's over all uh, the dimensions, but basically the main batch dimension. And we can also uh, compute the accuracy just to get another idea of how well we're doing. 
And for that, so we're using this um, uh, t dot eek, which you know, compares equality between our predicted class and the symbolic uh, targets. And again, we'll uh, compute the mean over the batch. Uh, so the next step is to get all the parameters in our network. And we do that using this other helper function, get all params. Again, we're going to pass an output layer, and it's going to travel back through the network, uh, finding all the layers that are connected to it. And by default, um, layers are tagged with whether or not they're trainable. So this is just something you could change. If you had some uh, layer in your network you didn't want to train, for example, you could change the tags on it. And then this, uh, you can also add your own tags and then give uh, filters here to tell it which parameters you want to get. Uh, so if you look at what we get, we just have that single layer with its weights and biases. Um, uh, so next step, we calculate the gradients. It's just t that grad of the loss with respect to those parameters. Um, from there, we can calculate updates. We're going to use basic uh, vanilla stochastic gradient descent. We give it the gradients, the parameters, and some value for the learning rate. And if we look at what we get, it's a update dictionary. So it's mapping you know, our weight matrix to some expression for the update and similarly for the biases. Um, now create a training function. So F train, we have to give it um, inputs, images, and targets. And we're going to have it compute for us the loss and the accuracy so we can see how it's doing. And it's also going to automatically apply those updates. Um, we do basically the same thing for uh, validation. But here, we don't want to um, do any updates because this is our validation data. We don't want to train with it. And finally, once it's trained, we can compute another function that's just going to give us um, the predicted class. If we wanted to, we could do the output here if we wanted to distribution. Um, so let's pick a batch size. Um, we're just going to compute some number of batches that approximately equal one pass of the data. And we'll call that an epoch. So this is being a little um, loose here, but it'll be fine for this. Um, we can create generators that will give us uh, data batches for training and validation. And just try that out so you can see that it's working. Uh, we can get um, a batch of images and labels. And we'll just look at the first one. It's an image of a 5. We got a 5 as a label, so that's working. Um, so now to actually do the training, we just uh, we'll do an outer loop um, for 10 epochs. And we're going to uh, track how we're doing in loss and accuracy. So in each epoch, we loop uh, for a number of mini batches. We'll get a batch of data, call our training function, and we get out the loss and accuracy values. We'll accumulate those and then average. And then we'll do the same thing for validation. Um, and finally, we'll just uh, print out how we're doing. And another thing that's useful to look at is the ratio of uh, validation loss to training loss, because this will tell us if we're Give us some idea of how badly we're overfitting. Um, so, so you can see we start out, get pretty quickly to 80% accuracy. After 10 epochs, we get up to about 92% accuracy. Um, and it won't really go up from here. And uh, so this is a pretty bad accuracy, but we have a very simple network. Um, and so basically, I mean, what we have is equivalent to logistic regression on the pixel values. And then one of the exercises it asks you to um, use scikit-learn to try a logistic regression. You'll see that you get basically the same value. Um, we can then take a look at uh, what our trained weights look like. So it's a shared, val shared variable, so we can use get value. Um, we access, so we have our layer. We can access the weights and get the value there as an array. And we see that we have, um, you know, one weight for each pixel on in the input. And then we have um, one of these for each uh, neuron in the layer. And we can 
view those as images. And you can sort of see it's learned something that looks kind of like the digits. Um, you know, zero and one are pretty easy to see. The others, maybe not so much. Um, and so, yeah, you can see that this is basically the same as logistic regression. Um, another thing that you can try is adding another layer of neurons um, in between the input and output. I'll just, you know, that, so, you know, that's a pretty simple thing to do. You just define a hidden layer, and then you connect your output to that instead. So, um, if you run this, I don't think it'll come up here, but you'll see you get up to, I don't know, something like 97% accuracy. And you can try playing with different numbers of uh, neurons, different numbers of layers. Um, another thing that's also important is the optimizer. Uh, if you try different uh, algorithms, you can see they'll converge you know, quicker. They might also diverge. You'll have to play with the learning rate a lot of the time. Um, and another thing that's kind of interesting is you can uh, look at the weight um, values that you get, and you'll see that they can look very different depending on what algorithm you're using. And that can be quite important when you're uh, working with more complex networks, because even though you might get to very similar performance, you're actually in a very different sort of part of the parameter space, and it can uh, have a big effect on your ultimate performance. Um, let's see. Let's see. Are there any questions about this? Um, not long. Let's actually I'm just try this. <coughs> it, where are we going? Yeah, sorry, I should have run this before. But okay, you can see here it's going now. It's taking about a second per epoch. And most of that time is actually probably because it's running on the GPU, transferring data back and forth. It's not really doing anything complicated. Um, you can see this one got to about. So here we're maybe overfitting a little bit. You can see that the um, we have a ratio of about 1.5, and our training accuracy is about 98 percent, but validation is only 97. Um, so in this case, you might want to add some sort of regularization to that in layer. Yeah. Is not really. So that gets back to what I was saying. So it's um, they said the deal lasagna is not to do like every possible thing, but to make it really easy to do things yourself. And so you can see I had to write my own training loop, but there's not really anything to it. It's just a Python loop. So if you wanted to do early stopping, I could just you know calculate this ratio, train the val, and if, have some condition to break out of this loop. Do we need to change the learning rate? So that's a great question. In this case, I would because of the way I did it. But you could also give a shared variable here instead of a, a constant learning rate. And then um, inside that outer loop, I could update the value of that shared variable. Yeah, so let's take a look. Um, So it has a number of things. It has add a delta, add a grad, and add them. So all of these um, will adjust the learning rate per parameter. So when you define the layer, you say branch layer mm -hmm. for the connector. Yep. So what are the alternatives? Can you share two or three? Um, sorry, I'm not sure I understand. So in the layer, you said uh, the option was branch layer. Mm -hmm. Right? So which means fully connected. Yeah. So I guess the next thing I'll talk about is convolutional uh, layers. Um, are there any other questions? Or, yeah. I have a more general question. All the things that are based on piano, because you don't, you have to actually compile the functions, mm -hmm. debugging the network is really problematic. Do you have anything to bug us on? Um, honestly, not really. Um, there are some good piano you know, tutorials on debugging, but I generally, yeah, the errors you get can be very annoying. Um, it's hard to tell what's going on. Um, but at this point, 
for this sort of feed forward networks, they're they're pretty well debugged. Um, if you're using lasagna and you're following the documentation on what kind of inputs to get, you really shouldn't get any errors. Um, when you start doing your own things, it gets a little more difficult. <laughs> so I'm going to talk now. So the alternative, um, so when we had that dense layer, um, so we were connecting every pixel in the input to each neuron, either in the output or the hidden layer. And so that's a lot of parameters. And so we overfit pretty quickly, even with just a single um, layer in there. The alternative is a convolutional network where we define um, small kernels, which are convolved with the input. And then uh, those give us an output image. Um, so this is just a simple example. We're going through the same thing we just did. Um, but now we're gonna, instead of a, a densely a fully connected in layer, we're going to use a single uh, convolutional layer. Uh, so one thing here now, we can't use our um, our vector input first. We have to reshape it into an image. Um, so that's just adding this reshape layer. Um, we're going to use uh, minus one to infer the batch size. Um, another thing, um, if you're not familiar with convolutional networks, the typical convention for the data is you have a batch dimension, a channel dimension, which is like RGB, and then your two image dimensions. So we want a four-dimensional input. Um, so that's what we're going to get from our reshape layer here. And then we do a, a conf 2D layer, because we have a 2D input. Um, so we're going to take the input from this this reshape layer, we're just going to have uh, three kernels, and we're going to make them uh, three by three. And we're also going to use, um, we're going to pad the input with one zero on each border, just so that we get an output of the same size. Yeah. Do you have a brief overview of the, the convolution operator and how kernelization works? Um, yeah, sorry, I should have had some slides on this. Um, so basically, uh, if you imagine just like a like a one, well, we have a one channel input. Uh, so we have some input matrix, and we're going to define our kernel as just a three by three matrix. So at every position in the input, uh, we multiply and sum over that three by three area, and that gives us one pixel on our output. And then we sweep that kernel over the full image, so we end up with an output image. Um, ignoring edge effects of the same size. And then it's typical that you have a multi-channel input. So there you have um, one, your kernel is three-dimensional with one layer for each channel in your input. And the convention is to then sum over those channels. Um, so you end up with a one-channel output. But you have one channel for each of these uh, kernels in your layer, and you typically have many of them. Um, so that, Make sense? Um, let's see. Uh, so basically, um, so you have this larger input image, and you have this three by three kernel. So just like say we're at starting at the top left corner, you would take that three by three region at the top left corner, you would do like a element wise multiplication with your three by three kernel. And then you would sum all those values into a single output. Is it binary though? Why do you have, so why do you have three filters? Um, so I'm doing three filters just because, um, well, so the number of filters here has no relation to the input. Um, basically, it's just each filter is going to be a sort of feature detector. And I decided I want three of them, mainly because then I can plot the output as an RGB image. Um, which I'm going to do in just a second. And then after this, um, we have a dense layer, same as before. So we're basically, we're barely increasing um, the complexity versus our logistic regression. Basically, after this convolution, we now have a 3 by 28 by 28 um, 
data instead of 1 by 28 by 28. But we can see when we run this, we get up to, you know, pretty high accuracy um, just with three filters. And if you added um, more filters, more layers, you could push this um, even farther. So, but what I want to do is look at the output after it's gone through this uh, convolutional layer. So we can do that just by um, using get output again. But here we're not using our output layer, we're using our, our convolutional layer. And we get an expression for the filtered image, and then we calculate a function to evaluate that. Um, so we're just going to look at the first few training examples. We run it through this function, we get out 10 uh, images, and just reshape them a little bit, and we can plot these. Um, this works. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, yeah, so what I find interesting is, um, I don't know if you can see the blue very well, but basically the different uh, filters have learned to be sensitive to different parts of the input. So here it looks like uh, blue is highlighting this uh, horizontal, red is more uh, vertical, and uh, green is maybe diagonal, I don't know. Um, and so this gives you some idea of how this can help improve the accuracy. Um, and then the basic idea of the deep learning is then you have many of these feature detectors and you have many layers. So you're hopefully creating features that can be sort of composed into, um, into other features that are more abstract. Uh, but because you're you don't have so many free parameters, it sort of should learn things that are reusable and general as well, which hopefully lets you um, get good results without so much overfitting. Uh, are there any questions about this? So each filter, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So what are the, I mean, what is the structure? Is it like random? Is it a that's a good question. Um, so they start out random. So that's um, where the, let's see. So when we define this conf 2D layer, it's going to give them some random initialization. Let me actually. Um, so you can give it a value for the weight matrix, and the default is this um, initialization scheme. You could also use one of the other initializers or some value of your own. Um, and then, yeah, they'll be trained through the uh, training loop that we defined. And if we wanted to, instead of, um, we could, after it's trained, we could access those. Oops. And so this is, you know, the training values. And if we wanted to, we could plot these and see what they looked like, like we did before. Um, do you have a question, too? Yeah, I was wondering how about the, uh, the defining resolution of the plot sensor, the movement of the image in the, the plot. Is there any sort of standardization of regularization you do before you start training it? Um, let's see. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, that's another one of the, the, the advantages of the convolution is that it should be somewhat, it's, so one of the assumptions, I guess, of it is that your input should be somewhat translation invariant. We should expect that if the thing moves, it shouldn't change our output. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is to define uh, a deeper network where you use pooling operations to take the average of the feature output over some small window. And so then if your input shifted within that window, you get the same output. Um, so that's how you would incorporate uh, translation invariance. You said that we saw for nine weights for that three by three kernel mm -hmm. for the convolution operator. Um, in this line, in this cell right here, you have several three by three matrices. Is that yeah, so, one for each layer? Right, so we had, this would be the first filter, second, third. So yeah, so 27 weights plus all the weights from these. Uh, so again, there's still, there's way more than this weights connecting um, 
the output dense layer. Um, yeah. So if we did, um, so if we get all the parameters, we can see that we have uh, two sets of weights and biases for the convolutional and the output layer. Um, and yeah, you can give your weights more informative names if you have a complicated network and you want to be able to tell where these parameters came from. Um, what do you mean by a different sort of scheme? I mean, like, so these weights don't directly feed into your nominator. Oh, so yeah, that's another important point. So by default, there is a rectified linear, rectified linear nonlinearity yeah. after every um, conf layer. Right, but these, like, the, the result of doing the element wide multiplication summing, that becomes like one parameter in the linear combination which then passes to the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that, in that thing, is there a different way to update these weights given that it's sort of one step before, like even one more step before the common error? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. Sorry. So, so like your, the, the last part of, of your chain gradient, mm -hmm. like in the middle layer, you have this, this diff, the, the, the derivative of your nonlinearity linearity with respect to each individual parameter that feeds into the linear combination, which is then passed. Um, I'm not still not sure I understand you, but I mean I think basically the gradient gets backpropagated through each step, okay. and so it only receives gradients that pass through the rectified linear nonlinearity. Okay. So that does cause problems if, for instance, you only had a, a negative activation, yeah. you would have no you would have no gradient because your output would always be zero. Okay. But that usually doesn't that doesn't happen that often in practice because you'll have a large mini batch and so hopefully for some example you'll get some positive activation and I think the answer is that it, it probably does get updated in the same way that Yeah, I think so. Network, just like more things to update because you have these more weights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not really an average, it's some, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, if, there, if you can say that there's a meaningful sequence and it has, you know, local regularity, then it should be meaningful. Um, so time series should probably work. Protein sequence. I think people have applied it to that problem. It's not immediately clear to me that there is a lot of, you know, local structure. Of it. Um, so that's where the pooling comes in. So you hope that, you know, as you pool your outputs, you're getting a, a longer range um, view. Um, so here I'm going to show um, a slightly more interesting example. Um, so here I'm going to take a, a large network that someone else trained on this ImageNet data set, which is a data set of millions of um, natural images with something like a thousand categories. And I'm going to apply it to my own classification problem. And this is often a really useful thing if you have um, some image data set, but it's fairly small, and you don't want to acquire you know, a million images of your own and then spend weeks training a network. Um, you can take the pre-trained network 
and just tweak the weights a little bit um, and use on your own data. So just as a silly example, I uh, went on Google image search and I got a few hundred images of either pancakes or waffles. Um, so let's, sorry, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Just to show you a few of the images that are in this uh, images directory. Here's some pancakes, waffles. So I mean, this isn't, I mean, it's pretty obvious what it is, but if you were just, you know, someone gave you images like this, how would you go about doing it? I mean, it's not a necessarily a trivial image classification problem. Um, I mean, they're pretty similar colors. But, um, they're both round. I guess these have some different texture to them. Um, so the network we're gonna use is what's called a VGG16. It's a 16 layer model. Um, it was either, it was one of the top scoring models a few years ago um, in this ImageNet uh, image recognition challenge. And uh, it's basically the same as what we've, it's not really using anything new that we haven't seen yet except for pool 2D layer, which just does this uh, down sampling operation that I was talking about. Um, uh, pooling. So pooling just, uh, you can define a uh, pooling kernel, usually two or three. So it's just gonna take a two by two window in your input and either take the maximum value or the average value within that window. And it's gonna apply that across your image to give you a, another image that's smaller by a factor of two or three or whatever your factor was. Um, well, so, I mean, by itself, it's just a layer that does that pooling operation. Then you could add another convolutional layer after that to do another um, set of convolutions. Uh, um, you typically wouldn't precede it because then you could just downsample your data before. Um, but yeah, what usually happens, if you look at the structure of this network, we're feeding in a RGB image that's 224 by 224 pixels. And there's um, two layers of convolution followed by a layer of pooling, and then that repeats. Another two layers of convolution, another layer of pooling, then three pool, three pool. So it's that's a typical, it's a fairly common um, arrangement that seems to work pretty well. Is either two or three convolution layers followed by a pooling layer, and then just repeat that until your final output image is a manageable size, like five by five or seven by seven, something like that. Um, after that then they apply a couple of uh, fully connected layers, um, followed by this uh, final fully connected layer is the output classifier. So in the original problem, there were a thousand classes, so they had one unit per class, and then a softmax um, at the end of that. There's no nonlinearity in a pooling layer, um, but in each convolutional layer. I mean, you could add the nonlinearity there if you want to, but um, there wouldn't really be a point because basically, if you're using rectified nonlinear non -linear at each conv layer, then you apply a pool layer, doesn't none of their nonlinear is not going to do anything. Uh, but there might be some case where you would want to. Um, um, yeah, so it's basically just, it's something that this conv layer function or class does, it tacks it on after doing the convolution. Um, yes, and yeah, by default it's rectified linear, but you can remove that or you can add any of, lasagna has a number of nonlinearities built in, or you can define your own. Um, define my own or, um, I mean, I experimented with things like the parameterized ReLU. Uh, I think the, the leaky ReLU is, sometimes gives better results. But yeah, no, I haven't come up with any schemes of my own. But, um, let's see. So you can download uh, the pre-trained weights from this address and to uh, load them and then 
here we're going to build this model that's just going to give us this dictionary of layers. Um, and so again, so lasagna, it tries to be simple, so it doesn't have something like a neural net class or something uh, like some other libraries do. Basically, you just define your layers, keep track of them however you like. I like to put them in a dictionary with um, informative names. Um, so to get those pre-trained weights, there's a helper function, set all param values. So we're going to give it an output layer. As usual, it's going to go back through the network, find all the connected layers. And we're going to give it uh, just a list of um, parameter values. So these are a list of uh, NumPy arrays with the appropriate sizes. So after this, we have a built model with the pre-trained weights in it. And we have to do some pre-processing to get images from disk into a form that it likes. We have to you know, shuffle it into that batch channel height width and also do some mean subtraction, um, cropping it to the right size. So this is just a helper function to do all that. Um, try it out. I'm going to take one of these images. This is what it looks like after going through the cropping and everything. It's waffles. Um, Let's see, so just pre-processing it all and then dividing into uh, training and validation sets. Um, I should clean this up a little. Sorry about all this. Um, so now we're going to take that uh, network and we're going to discard the output classifier, which was trained for the thousand classes of ImageNet. We're going to create our own. It's just a dense layer connected to the second to last layer um, with one unit for each of our classes, pancakes, waffles. And we're going to have a softmax nonlinearity. Um, after that, we do the usual stuff, define our symbolics, um, get our output and our loss, get our parameters or updates, and define training functions. Um, here, it's a fairly large network, so we have to use a smaller batch size than we have been. Otherwise, we'll run out of GPU memory. And then we're going to define helper functions. These will just uh, pick a random batch from our data, feed it through either the train or the validation function. Um, and then do our usual training loop. Let's see. So we can see after, I call these epochs, but they're not really. Um, it's just a, so after five sets of 25 batches, we've gone from 90% up to almost 94% accuracy. Um, and we can then uh, take a look at how we do on the validation set, looking at some of these images. So here, um, the, value, the gray number is the true class, and it's either green if it's correct or red if we made a mistake. Um, so you can see we, we do pretty well. Um, I mean, some of these are you know, fairly. We have some strange things in our training set. So yeah, I mean, 94% is not amazing. But before I went too much farther, I mean, it's a nice quick baseline. And you'd probably want to go through and you know clean this data set a little bit. Um, but you can also try you know changing where you attach your output layer. Um, adding some regularization, things like that. Yep. Uh, no, there was a waffle iron class, but yeah, I checked that there were these are not in the original training data. I, I do wonder if the waffle iron helps or not. It's, um, the learning rate. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated when you get a deep network um, to figure out what the weights actually are representing. Um, there's a lot of papers that try different methods for um, interpreting them. And there's actually a nice, um, in the recipes repository, uh, someone else has made this nice notebook that tries out a couple of those, um, basically showing how you can uh, try to visualize what is being 
seen at different layers in the network. Um, but you can see all these different uh, methods give very different uh, outputs. And it's a little tricky to tell what's actually happening. So I prefer just to go by the, the performance metrics most of the time. A uh, question in the back? So I only have examples of supervised, um, but the is definitely used for a lot of uh, unsupervised learning. Oh yeah, so one other point is, so for this, um, sorry, because we're trying to fine tune it, we assume our weights are already pretty close to what we want. So I'm using a much smaller learning rate than we did before. Um, so this is something you'd also want to play with um, in a real problem. And you might also want to do things like adjust the learning rate, have a higher learning rate for your output classifier. And again, that's not something Lasagna does um, automatically, but it's something you could easily do by separating this list of parameters into the ones for your output layer and the other layers and defining a different learning rate for them. Um, so I'm running a little low on time. But, um, so this is another thing. This uh, something that came out, I think, this summer. Uh, neural art you may have heard of. Um, these people found a really interesting way to uh, blend a style of a painting with the content of a photograph. Um, so this is just an example of how you can do that in lasagna. Um, the basic idea is that you compute the activations at some uh, deep layer in your network, uh, and then um, look at the correlation between different filters, and then compare that, uh, optimize the difference between that for your, your style and your uh, content images. Um, well, or sorry, between your generated and your style images, and also the, um, the activation differences between your content and your generated image. Um, so, so this uses that same uh, VGG network. Uh, actually, this is, I think, VGG 19. It's just got a few more convolutional layers in it. Um, but it's defined in the same way. We have uh, pre-trained weights and same pre-processing stuff. So basically, there's some of the, so this is the uh, content image photograph, uh, some buildings, and our style is a starry night painting. And so we have to define a, uh, an expression for this thing called the gram matrix, which just gives us that uh, correlation between different feature channels. Um, What's a filter oh, sorry. So, like I was saying before, like for each convolutional kernel, you apply it to an image and you get out an image, and you call that like a feature or activation image. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, they're changing. I mean, it's just terminology. Like you would consider the output after one of these convolutional layers to be like a feature map. Um, you have one feature map or, or you, like each feature map corresponds to just one training sample. Um, yeah, although in practice you would have like a batch of images, but yeah. Um, you'd say like the, the feature map at some layer for a particular example has some values. Okay. Um, Um, so yeah, like I was saying, we have like a, a content loss, which is just a square distance um, between. So here we're giving it uh, two. These would be feature maps, um, or collections of feature maps. Um, and we have the style loss, where we basically uh, start with the same thing, we calculate this gram matrix, and then we calculate the squared difference between those for the uh, two images. And this is just another thing that uh, penalizes differences between neighboring pixels, which helps make the output less noisy. Um, so to do this, we uh, take the 
the loss at several different layers in the network. And depending on which ones you pick, you'll get sort of different outputs. Um, sorry, I'm going kind of fast, but uh, sorry, let's skip over. And so here's an example of that uh, I was talking about before. Like we can define uh, different coefficients for these different portions of the loss function, and finally we just you know sum up these different uh, things to get a final expression. Again, we just, as usual, we take a gradient with respect to that total loss, um, and we can define functions for it. Um, so something that's kind of interesting here, too, is uh, for this particular method, stochastic gradient descent does not work very well. Um, what works well is this um, LBFGS optimizer. And as far as I know, no one's implemented that in Theano directly. But what you can do is, you know, you can hook into SciPy. Um, you can get your outputs from Theano, pass them into that, and then pass uh, the results back into Theano. And it's a little uh, roundabout, but it it works fine. On CPU. What's that? Yeah, so that happens on the CPU. So maybe it doesn't work fine. It's not. It's probably not as fast as doing it um, on the GPU. But I think most of your time is actually um, computing these these convolutions, so it doesn't really slow you down too much to do the optimization on the CPU. Um, so this is some examples of what it looks like. We start from a noise image. You start to get some of the color and uh, texture appearing. After some more iterations, you know, you get more texture. And then you start to see uh, some of the content coming in. And continues until um, draw you on the, the final image. It doesn't really fit on the monitor, unfortunately. But I think this looks really cool. Um, and if you go to their lab and look at what else they've done, they've generated some really amazingly realistic uh, texture images with a very similar um, method, where they're not trying to optimize content, but just texture. And it's, it's kind of crazy how well it works. Um, so this is just an example of you know what you can do with this stuff. I mean, this paper came out, and I was able to implement this in you know a couple of days because of all the stuff that's already you know available, all the tools are already there. Um, let's see. Um, so another thing you can uh, try are uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, so this is a sort of different, it's kind of similar to convolution, um, but it's a different idea that you're going to process a sequence of data, and basically you're going to um, apply like the same uh, weight matrices to each time step. You have some, so at each time step you have some input value, and you have a, a hidden state that persists from your last time step and you're going to apply some matrices that tell you how to compute a new hidden state from the previous and the current input. Um, and so one thing that you can do that this is kind of interesting is take some input text and try to train your model to predict what the next character in your text will be. Um, and if it can learn to do that, then you can sort of um, sample from that and get an output sequence that looks somewhat like your uh, your training data. It's got similar vocabulary and um, sort of phrasing. Uh, so you may have seen a char RNN, which was an example that was pretty popular of this. Um, people have applied it to a lot of different things, um, you know, like political speeches, uh, magic cards. You can generate all sorts of interesting sequences this way. Um, so I decided to try this out using uh, data from patent claims. Uh, which is a freely available data set. And so this is what some of the the training data looks like. It's just uh, sentences describing claims and patents. Um, so you could do this either at like a word level, um, or you'd have like a one-cut encoding for each word in your vocabulary, but it's easier um, 
to do if you do it just at the character level. So here I'm calculating a vocabulary that's just the distinct characters that occur in the, the corpus, and then calculating uh, mappings from characters to integer and one hot representations. And um, so I'm going to look at um, define a network that's going to look at sequences that are 50 steps long. Um, and I'm going to have a recurrent layer with 200 hidden units in it. So to train it, uh, create a generator that's going to sort of randomly pick sentences from this corpus and feed them to me in sequence of that 50 characters. But something we want is that uh, we want to make sure that subsequent samples from this generator give us the next 50 characters in the sequence um, because we want to uh, we don't want to have these you know, jumps. So if you look, uh, here I'm just taking some samples from that generator so you can see that these sentences align with each other. And then to actually use this to train, we want to take in some text. We want to give out a, uh, a uh, convert that from characters into um, integer indices. And then we also want to define targets, um, which is just the, uh, the same sequence, but delayed or uh, moved forward by one character. Um, so the shape of our day is a little bit different. We, can, we have a batch dimension, we have a sequence length dimension, and then we have a one dimensional uh, data input. And again, we define our input variables, except we need to do something a little bit different, which is that we need uh, input variables for the, the hidden state, because we want to, um, we're going to save the output hidden state after, at the end of each sequence, and then feed that in at the start of the, uh, the next sequence. And we have, we're going to have a, a two-layer network, so we need to do that twice. Uh, so here, define input layer. Um, find what's called um, GRU layer, uh, and so we're going to give it this uh, parameter hidden in it, which is going to tell it how to um, map that symbolic variable into the initial hidden state. And then we add a second layer, same exact thing. Um, so to get the output from this, we want to uh, go back from the hidden state, which is this 200-dimensional vector, into a character. And to do that, we're going to have a dense layer um, where we have one unit per character. So we're gonna, and we're going to have a softmax nonlinearity. So that's going to give us a mapping from 200-dimensional vector to a probability distribution over the characters. Um, but one complication in that is we first have to reshape um, this output, which has you know batch sequence um, feature dimensions because we don't want our dense layer to be connected to our the different um, time points in the sequence. We want each time point to be processed independently. So we do a little trick where we um, just merge the sequence dimension into the batch dimension with this reshape layer, and then after the decoder, we reshape it back so that we get an output um, for each time point. So that's our, our output layer. And in addition to getting the probability distribution, we're also going to need the hidden states. So here we're using get output, um, but we're doing it a little bit differently. Whereas before we would give a single a layer, here we give a list of the layers. So we're going to take the hidden from the first layer, hidden two from the second layer, and then the probability distribution from the output layer. Um, and again, we just give our input sequence. And the hidden state, we're only interested in the final time step, so we just index um, that. Um, we need to do a little reshaping to do the uh, cross-entropy loss. And again, we end up with a loss function as usual. Um, so these networks are a little more complicated to train. Um, they tend to have stability problems because you're, it, you're repeatedly applying the same matrix over and over. Um, so some common things to do are to take your gradients clip them to a maximum value, also apply like a total norm constraint to them. So these are some helper functions that will do this, um, these modifications for you.
um, that we're using uh, update function. We're compiling our training function, which now we have to uh, give it in addition to our input, our targets, we also have to give it the initial values for the hidden state, and we're going to compute several outputs. Um, and we train this thing. So this takes something like an hour to train, um, but you can load the pre-trained values here, and then we can also calculate a prediction function um, where we don't give it a target value input. And so to make it run faster for prediction, something we can do is we're not going to give it 50 character sequences. We're just going to step through it uh, one time step at a time. So we rebuild the network where we've just changed sequence length to one. And, but all the parameters are the same shape, so we can just stuff our um, pre-trained values back in there. Um, in order to get an initial state to, um, into the network, we're going to sample a random sentence from the validation corpus, and we're going to feed that through there before calculating our output. Um, so to do that, you basically um, call the prediction function with character from the primer. These hidden states are initially zeros, and you get out a prediction and the new hidden states. And you repeat that. Um, so we take, um, yeah, we repeat that for every character on the primer. Then we do the same thing. But now we're actually taking that prediction. We're um, sampling from that distribution. And then we're taking that character and adding it to our generated sentence and then feeding that sample character back in as the next input. And so we're going to do this until we get to a line break. And so you can see you know, the text that comes out is fairly intelligible. Um, these are mostly real words. And you could uh, maybe see this as a patent claim. Um, so one interesting thing you can also do is uh, this what's called a temperature softmax. So you can uh, change the normalization of that uh, distribution, and you can uh, you can lower the temperature, and that will make uh, it less. It'll make it stick uh, closer to what it's seen. So you might get less things like um, venter, but it will also become more conservative. So you might see it start repeating words or get stuck in a loop where it says you know, the same thing again, like to the variation of, to the variation of over and over again. So you can play with the temperature to see uh, how it affects the giant text. Um, I think, I think I'm not going to go into this now because we're almost out of time. Um, this is just a, another example. You can do a similar thing, but you can initialize with a feature vector derived from one of these deep convolutional networks. So you can take a picture, use that as your initial hidden state, and you can train it on this data set of sentences describing pictures that um, people have put together. And you can get things that kind of make sense. Um, I don't think this network is trained particularly well, but you know this sentence has dog and cat in it. Um, so you can kind of feel like maybe it's working. Yeah, I mean, this looks like a stuffed animal. I'd, I'd buy that. Um, but people have also taken this much further where you can then, you can uh, detect different portions of the image and um, put that in as separate uh, features and then you can get much more interesting things where it might say, you know, a cat is sitting next to a dog. Um, let's see. So yeah, I'd encourage you to play with that a little bit. It's kind of fun. Um, so finally, I just want to talk briefly about extending lasagna which is something that you're definitely encouraged to do. So it's supposed to be very easy to define your own layers if there's an operation that you want to do that's not available. Uh, basically, all you have to do is define a class uh, from subclassing the base layer class. You have to implement get output for, which is going to take some theorem expression, apply your operation to it, and then return an expression. And if whatever you're doing changes the output shape, you just have to take a, uh, a shape tuple, which is just a tuple of either constants or nuns, calculate what the new shape will be and return that. So those three operations are all you have to do. And then you can use the whole rest of the framework. <laughs>
Um, so this is just an example I did for something called fractional pooling, which is like that 2D pooling layer, but it uh, it can do things like uh, downsample by like a factor of 1.5 by sort of randomly taking um, pixels with some probability depending on that factor. And this is kind of an interesting thing because it will give you different outputs each time you run it. Um, so like this is a picture of Rubik's Cube. Unfortunately, you can't get these both on the screen, but you can see they sort of get warped in different ways because the downsampling changes. And this is another thing that can help regularize your network um, and prevent overfitting. And it can also let you, um, you know, downsample slower so you uh, preserve more details as you go through the network. Um, are there any more questions? I'm almost out of time. Um, that is a good question. I did in, I believe in here. No, I did not. Uh, in this, it's not. Oh, how, how is it possible? Yeah, so it's, it's basically just, um, so there's dropout layers are a very common thing. And um, you can also, these regularization functions, like if I wanted the L2, um, I would just say, um, I could say regularize network params, and that would give it the output layer, and that would give me a, an expression that corresponds to an L2 penalty on each parameter in that layer. Or I could pass it individual parameters, and then add a coefficient. Can you pass this um, summation with the cost function as well? Yeah, so once you did this, you would get an expression, you would just add that to your loss function, and it would all happen. Um, so there's some other alternatives. I mean, do you want Theano or um, just alternatives in general? Okay. Um, so there's other Theano alternatives like uh, Keras and PyLearn too, are some big ones. Um, they tend like each one tends to have a different audience. So Keras is maybe better if you want like a scikit-learn style interface, where you can you know give it you know x y fit predict. Um, there's also other things like Cafe, which I think, and Torch. Uh, personally, I like Python, so I'm kind of st sticking to. Uh, the, I don't know, base libraries. Um, although Cafe is also pretty nice. They've been around for a long time. They, it works well, and I think it has a bit of a speed advantage. Um, one thing about Theano, if you've been trying to run any of this stuff, you may have noticed it takes a while when you compile functions. Um, that usually only happens the first time. It'll cache a lot of stuff. So, but it's definitely a drawback when you're trying to rapidly experiment. You might have to wait you know, for seconds or minutes to compile your expressions. Um, but I think it has the advantage that defining new stuff from a mathematical formula is pretty simple. Like, you don't have to write a whole lot of code. Um, so that, as you see, is the big advantage. Um, you mean in terms of input or what layers? Layers. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of trial and error. Um, I think this uh, this VGG structure is pretty common. I've used it for a lot of different problems. Not this exact structure, but the idea of a few convolutions followed by a pooling repeated until you get to a small output. Um, and then either fully connected layers or you can use one by one convolutions over your output map. That seems to work quite well. Um, there's other things um, like the Google Net or the Inception Network. It's for sometimes, sometimes those give better results, but I think they're harder to optimize um, and just more complicated. Um, not really. I mean, it's it's from this paper, uh, very deep convolutional networks. Uh, they defined a number of variants of it there that they tested on ImageNet, um, but it's 
I mean, that's how I would characterize the, the basic idea is just convolutions and pooling. Yeah, so the big thing you want to do is um, monitor overfitting. Um, so usually what people say you should do is make the network large enough that it overfits and then add regularization. And that usually takes the form of uh, dropout layers, which are going to randomly um, remove some of the feature activations in different places. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming.